see anybody from behind the tree? <laughs> Good morning. Happy Advent to all that are here. Uh, that, pre that precedes Merry Christmas, uh, but it's not Christmas yet. It's still, or just now, Advent. And we're glad that you're here today. Uh, welcome. And, uh, and enjoy uh, your company of friends and enjoy worship this morning. If you're a guest and you would so like to do, uh, pull out one of the pew cards in front of you and fill it out, drop it in the offering plate as it comes by. That will help us uh, connect with you and know that you were here this morning. Um, also, just a, just a quick announcement or two, you'll notice that the Christmas tree is here. Um, two years ago, Beth Parker snuck a 13-foot tree in on your new pastor, and it was anchored about six ways in this room, and uh, I told her we'd never do that again, uh, and then I reneged. This one's 12 feet, and uh, it was put here, along with all the other decorations, Monday night, uh, as people from all over the church gathered and hung the green, so... This is our Fraser fir this year. Um, also, you'll notice that uh, these stoles are a little different. These stoles were made by Beth Parker, believe it or not. Uh, she's pretty talented, and they, they almost match. They have the four scenes of the nativity in them. So, um, so we're grateful to you for your artistry. If you would, uh, pull out your bulletin. Let's look at a few announcements in it. Uh, I won't go through the entire list. I'll leave that up to you to read. But I'd like to point out that the choir is having an extra rehearsal at 1.30 today. So if you're singing uh, in the choir or in the cantata, uh, that's you. Then on Wednesday, notice that dinner is at 5.30 and that we are having the family Advent service at 6.30. So that's, uh, that's this Wednesday, a little different than what we usually do. And this is the night that you bring your toys to be donated to CCM, and we bring them and put them under the tree uh, that night. Uh, I think it's also the night that we bring Christmas ornaments, right? Yeah. So bring your family Christmas ornament and add it to the Christmas tree. Um, I'm going to go all the way to the bottom of the page now, and you'll notice that we have a Christmas basket progress update. We still need more cornmeal, and we still need more jelly. So as you are picking up the things on the back this week, i.e. Pop-Tarts, granola bars, cereal bars, etc., as you're getting those, throw an extra uh, bag of cornmeal or an extra jar of jelly in the cart with it, and that will catch us up on what we need for our Christmas baskets. And if you don't know, uh, our Christmas baskets are just, uh, they are meals for families. They get donated through the Salvation Army. Uh, and they go to needy families in the area. So it's a good cause uh, that we are up to. Um, as I said, today is the first Sunday of Advent, and we're glad you're here. Why don't you stand up and greet the people around you?
us pray. Lord, we are here. We've had a whirlwind this past week with giving thanks with our family and friends and then on to decorating our church and our homes for the new season. Now it's the time to wait, to wait and to anticipate. Give us your peace and your love to sit with as we look toward your arrival. Help us to pause this morning, put our frantic thoughts away, and to worship. Accept the praise we bring. Amen. You may be seated. It is our tradition during Advent that we light the candles on the Advent wreath uh, throughout the season of Advent on our way to Christmas. Um, Among other things, the candles that represent hope, peace, joy, and love also represent the growing light of Jesus Christ in our lives as we move toward Christmas morning. Each week, another candle is added to that light, and it gets brighter and brighter and brighter. Um, It's at this time that I would like to invite uh, James Carl and Ann Shoemate down, uh, and they will be be helping us uh, light the first candle, the candle of hope, on the Advent wreath. join with me in the litany that is printed there. Advent is a time to wait. During Advent, we wait for the light in the darkness. We wait in hope. God is our help and our shield. During Advent, we wait for freedom from captivity. During Advent, we wait for comfort in sorrow. We wait in hope. God God is our help and our shield. During Advent, we wait for power in our weakness. During Advent, we wait upon the Lord. We wait in hope. God God is our help and and our shield. This morning, we light the first candle. The first candle reminds us that as we wait upon the Lord, God's light never ceases to shine, God's will never ceases to unfold, and God's grace never ceases to be felt. As we begin the journey of Advent, may we learn to wait upon the Lord with hopeful expectation by celebrating all that God has done and anticipating all that he will do. Take your insert.
the prophet speaks a message of hope to the Israelites about the coming reign of God. A reading from the book of Isaiah. The word that Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In the days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of mountains and shall be raised above the hills. All the nations shall stream to it. Many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall come forth instruction, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He, sh he shall judge between the nations and shall arbitrate for many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. O house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. Here ends the first lesson. Let's pause and prepare our hearts and our minds to pray together. Good and gracious God, it is such a gift, such a gift to be invited into a place of worship like this one during this season. God, already we can feel Christmas coming over the horizon. Already we are singing of Jesus' birth in that little town of no repute in the middle of nowhere. God, this morning we come and we begin our journey toward the manger. We begin our journey toward that ever-growing light. And God, we ask today that you will abide with us as you promised that you would do over and again. Abide with us as we make this pilgrimage of faith toward that holy manger. God, we bring many cares and concerns with us, each of us do today. I ask and we ask that just for a little while, you will hold them for us. Take the weight off of our shoulders that we may find a little breathing room in this great space that we might worship and pray and sing and give thanks. God, each time we gather, we pray the Lord's Prayer together. It is a good discipline, and it teaches us about prayer. We do, we do that now, Lord, joining our voices and boldly saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. <coughs> Number 90 in your hymnal, People Look East, is our prayer response today. Come on, children, you're stuck with me today. I think I'm the only one that would answer Bridget's text. <laughs> Eric Martin. <laughs> Jocelyn wanting to come down? Come on. I ain't that bad. Stay with her. Good morning. Have any of you ever heard any of your parents or grandparents say kind of old sayings like, uh, don't count your chickens before they hatch? Do you know what that means? What? We learned it in class. We learned it in class, but do we remember? No. <laughs> that means don't count on it till it happens. I mean, you can expect it to happen, but it might not. What about uh, a bird in the bush? A bird in the hands better than two in the bush. Have you heard that? I've heard it my whole life. It means be happy with what you got. You got one in your hand, but there's two in the bush that you're not guaranteed to get. But you got the one, so be happy with what you got. So what about a uh, don't judge a book by its cover? What do you think that means? Well, it could mean a book until you read it. Don't judge it by its cover. Or I think it kind of means people. Don't judge people how they look. Uh, let me give you an example. About two weeks ago, Blaine and Nicole, you all know baby Meredith. Meredith had a real bad night. And the doctor told Blaine and Nicole, it's time to worry. You need to step out of the room while we work on her because she's having a bad night. So Blaine and Nicole went down to the chapel. And if you've ever been in the chapel of a hospital, they're tiny. Maybe like two pews and no room. So it's like 2 o'clock in the morning. Blaine and Nicole went down to the chapel to pray. That's all they knew to do. So they walked in. There was a guy sitting in the back, in the very back by himself, 2 o'clock in the morning. Didn't look the best in the world. Kind of scary looking. But Blaine and Nicole, being good people like they are, they decided to go ask the guy if it was okay 
for them to pray. They wanted to pray and didn't want to disturb him. And he said, I don't care. Go ahead and pray. And I want to pray with you. So he got up, went down front, and started praying with them. Blaine said it was the most beautiful prayer he has ever heard. Said he uh, prayed words that he has never heard before. And Blaine said when they got done, he gave him the biggest hug that Blaine has ever had. He said it just made me feel so good that he'd done this for us. And if Blaine and Nicole would have been the type of people that judge books by their cover, they would have probably turned around and left, left him sitting there. But they didn't, and they got a blessing for it. So that's kind of what Jesus wants us to do. They want us to see on the inside of your heart and your inside of your body and not how you're dressed and how you look and how your hair looks. And so just always try to see the good in people because that's what Jesus wanted us to do. All right. Let's have a quick prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for these kids and we thank you for this church and just be with baby Meredith and hopefully she pulls through this. She's having, they're trying to wean her off the ventilator this morning and just pray that everything goes good, and we all ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. The birth of John the Baptist is foretold. A reading from the Gospel of Luke. In the days of King Herod of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly order of Abijah. His wife was a descendant of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Both of them were righteous before God, living blamelessly according to all the commandments and regulations of the Lord. But they had no children, because Elizabeth was barren, and both were getting on in years. Once when he was serving as a priest before God and his section was on duty, he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to enter the sanctuary of the Lord and offer incense. Now at the time of the incense offering, the whole assembly of the people praying outside. Then there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was terrified, and fear overwhelmed him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will name him John. You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He must never drink wine or strong drink. And even before his birth, he will be filled with the Holy Spirit. He will turn many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. With the spirit and power of Elijah, he will go before him to turn the hearts of parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, to make ready the people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah said to the angel, How will I know this is so? For I am an old man and my wife is getting on in years. The angel replied, I am Gabriel, I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. But now, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time, you will become mute, unable to speak, until the day these things occur. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondered at his delay in the sanctuary. When he did come out, he could not speak to them, and they realized he had seen a vision in the sanctuary. He kept motioning to them and remained unable to speak. When his time of service had ended, he went to his home. After those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and for five months she remained in seclusion. She said, This is what the Lord has done for me when he looked favorably on me and took away my disgrace I have endured among my people. Here ends the gospel lesson. Our hymn of stewardship today is number 81, Let All Mortal Flesh Keep Silence. We'll stand as we sing.
bow with me as we pray. Lord God above, of heaven and earth, we thank you so much for all you, you mean to us. We ask these blessings upon this, on this crowd, on this group, Lord, and we, um, we know there's no way that we can, can love you as much as you love us. We feel the warmth of your love even this wintry day. We feel your love because of the loved ones and family and friends beside us. We feel your love because it's beautifully, beautifully decorated sanctuary. We feel your love, Lord, just because it's here, and we sense that. And Lord, when you love someone, you want to give. You want to give them a gift, and we want to give a gift to you, Lord, and we do that now with our gifts, our offerings of material goods and of ourselves. In your holy name we pray. Amen.
I'll begin with a confession this morning. When, when Advent 1 rolls around, there are so many things going on all of a sudden that sometimes I forget to mention one or two. The one I forgot to mention this morning is that on the door uh, into the uh, foyer over here, you probably can't see it from in this room, but on that door there is a poster. It's about six feet high and about two feet wide and it is a it's what they call a paschal candle it is a christ candle kind of like that white one in the middle of that wreath only this one is a giant poster that will get colored throughout the season of advent christy uh, started the poster and she has colored the pieces that are filled in and by the end of the season it will be filled in completely It'll go piece by piece as we go through the season. So on your way out today, uh, don't miss that pretty piece of art. Well, uh, we've made it. We've made it through Thanksgiving. Uh, if you ate leftover turkey last night, you're probably still trying to get over the drowsiness. Uh, I know that I had to take three or four naps. I don't know if that's because of the tryptophan or if it's because I ate too much. I'm sure none of you did that over the course of the holiday. Um, but anyway, here we are. It's Advent 1, and, uh, and I want to start by saying that throughout this season of Advent, I am going to be preaching off lectionary. 
Uh, the lectionary we usually follow uh, gave us some good lessons, some good readings, but I wanted to change them for Advent so that we get good stories like Elizabeth and Zechariah instead. And, um, and since I'm going to be preaching off of lectionary, it seems perfectly reasonable that this be the time when I give a primer on the lectionary, right? Not going to use it? Might as well talk about it a little bit. Of course, every now and then I like to do this so that we know what we're up to here. Um, the lectionary, the revised common lectionary that we follow, runs in a three-year cycle. The years are very creatively called A, B, and C. Uh, you couldn't have come up with that. It takes smart people, very smart people, to come up with such names as A, B, and C. And each one of these year uh, titles uh, refers to one of the synoptic gospels. So A is Matthew, B is Mark, and C is Luke. Now, synoptic just means the same or similar. And the point being that these three Gospels have kind of a similar structure, a similar world view as they tell the story of Jesus. And so the lectionary, by its nature in this three-year cycle, goes through those three books in a continuous way, A, B, C, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John is a little different. Uh, John, we think, is written almost in isolation of those three Gospels, uh, whereas Matthew, Mark, and Luke probably shared sources and even borrowed from one another. John seems to be have written somewhere else by someone else. And so what the lectionary does with John is intersperse John throughout all three years. A lot of times you'll hear from John in holy seasons like Lent or on holidays like Easter. But uh, today we begin Advent 1, which is the first day of the Christian year, and we begin year A again. We come back around to year A, and in this season, had I not changed it, we would have been doing the Gospel of Matthew. But... I want to do Luke instead. And since I'm writing the sermons and, uh, and since I'm interested in Luke, it'd probably be more fun for all of us anyway. This season, I want to uh, focus in on Luke because Luke uh, has all these interesting stories in it. You know, Matthew, Mark, and Luke all treat the beginning of Jesus' life differently. Mark, for instance just jumps over it. You hit the ground running in the gospel, Mark. Jesus is a full-grown man at the very beginning, and you go. Matthew's somewhere in the middle. Matthew gives us a little bit of the story. It gives us this genealogy that somehow suspectly traces Jesus back to David, back to the beginning, and then we get the story of Jesus' birth, and then we're off, and Jesus is an adult there. But there's something about Luke that I like, something about Luke that has to get a running start. Something about Luke, he's the guy at the party that, you, that you'll go to this season, that when you say, tell me the story about, Luke's going to start, well, I was born in 1961, and my brother was born in, and so forth and so on. And by the time you get to the story, you're not even sure what happened. Mark, on the other hand, is going to say, now Jesus did this. But Luke, Luke eases in. Luke begins all the way back, not with Jesus' birth, not with a story about his parents, not with John the Baptist's birth, not with his ministry and all that stuff, but all the way back with John the Baptist's parents. That's where we begin. And it's in Luke that you get all those familiar pieces. You get shepherds. You get Mary's Magnificat. 
You get Zechariah's prophecy. You get all of those things. So really, if you want the, tr- the Christmas that you're always most accustomed to, you open the book to Luke, and you just add a few dashes of Matthew. So you get the wise men. I want us to do Christmas this year and this morning, beginning with the story of John the Baptist's parents, Elizabeth and Zechariah. In my reading, this is a story of hope in the face of hopelessness. It is a story of how the old will play a part in ushering in the new. It is a story of pious people living good lives and still needing something more. From the text, we can pretty quickly gather some information about these two people. Number one, we're told that they are older, Zechariah and Elizabeth. Zechariah is a priest in the order of Aaron, and that means that he tends uh, the temple ministry. That is his vocation and his calling in life. And he is one of many priests that do this, that go over and tend to the holy things of God in the temple. Um, All we can tell, Zechariah is very, very faithful in this. Luke, Luke doesn't really say otherwise. He is faithful to the letter of the law. He is faithful to his service. He probably gives money to the temple to support its ministries. He probably even occasionally invites a friend to go to church, I mean the temple, with him. Zechariah. He is the pious, the, in, in the pious in the best sense of the word. He is the pious, church-going man. And Elizabeth and Zechariah, by extension of that, I think are good church folk, metaphorically. Their story, though, is somehow tragically flawed. Elizabeth has never been able to have children. You got that. That's the whole uh, crux of the story. And as Luke tells it, she's now elderly and is really facing uh, the possibility that she will never have children, that it's not going to happen. Now, in, in the modern world, such a thing is hard, and it's certainly uh, painful. But in the ancient world, such a thing is layered with other things, too. Most importantly, such a thing is layered with this notion, this theological notion, that something is wrong with Elizabeth. And by extension, perhaps something is wrong with Zechariah, too. You can almost, if you listen closely enough to the story, hear the echo of hushed whispers as they walk into the room. What evil or sin do you think they are hiding, says somebody. What is the pious priest and his wife being punished for, says somebody else. It would be very hard to live Elizabeth's life in this story. It would be very hard to live Zechariah's life in this story because that was the way that people conceived of birth in the first century world. Then, against all the odds, a baby comes. You can hardly blame Zechariah for being dumbfounded and doubting it. I mean, look at the odds that are against these two people. Look at what they have listened to and endured all these years. And yet, Elizabeth is pregnant. Elizabeth has prayed for this for so long. She knows that it doesn't happen for everyone, and she is struggling to make sense of it, 
just like she struggled to make sense of not having a baby for so very long. Against all odds, against all gossip, against all oppressive theology, hope shows up in these two lives. In the Lucan nativity set that includes Mary and Joseph, John the Baptist and Jesus and others, Elizabeth and Zachariah are the good, solid, church-going folk. It's who they are. It's all over them. Their story and its inclusion here is a comfort to me. I hope by extension, that it is a comfort to you, too. For you see, by including the good, solid temple folk in the story, the Gospel of Luke has included us, too. I mean, I'm, I'm around here a lot. I know most of you pretty well. And you fit the bill of good, solid, church-going folk. Some of you look a little bit more like Elizabeth. Some of you look a little bit more like Zechariah. Some of you look a lot worse than both, could have. I won't tell you who I was looking at, you can guess. But Elizabeth and Zechariah hold our place in this story. They hold that place of people who live ordinary lives, week in, week out, day in, day out, who do everything they can to be faithful and who still face hardship as they go along. For Thanksgiving this past week, Christy and I went home uh, to my home, to Maysville, and we we ate too much and, and we stayed up too late and all those things that you do when you're with family. Um, On Saturday, we went down uh, to Milford, Kentucky, which is uh, a few of you have been there. And, uh, And we went down there because my grandmother, who passed away almost two years ago now, Uh, has left a lot of things behind that we have to go through. It was kind of my first time going down there and looking through things. It was Christy's first time ever setting foot in their home, my grandparents' home. And, uh, and you know, it was, it was hard. It, it was hard. Um, and we, we went in, and, and, of course, Christy says, I've never been in here. And so I delighted in that. I showed Christy, well, over here, this is where the cash register was, and this big shelf, this is where the candy was. And that was a good time for me. And in front of it was the, was the ice box, the Coke machine. And you didn't put quarters in it, you just reached in there and got it out. And if you were the grandson, you didn't have to pay for it. Uh, but everybody else did. And, uh, and then over here on this wall... Uh, There were all these pictures, Kentucky Colonel, there's JFK, my mom was a big fan of JFK, and then around into the garage where all the parts used to hang from the ceiling and the two bays where you could lift a car and work on a car and all the tools and all the mess Uh, and back there's the sink where we used to wash our hands after we came in from the back. Then we went upstairs. This is where we did Christmas. This is where we ate. But it wasn't the same. It wasn't the same. It was, uh, it was empty. And, uh, and there was stuff left, but not all of it. It looked like it had been half moved out of now. I thought about my grandparents and their lives. You know, I thought about my grandfather who died at about 78 years old of a heart attack. You know, he was a lot like Zechariah. He worked very hard. He went to mass every, every Sunday morning. But he died of a heart attack at 78, a little too young, I think. 
And my grandmother, who was older, but boy, did she live through hard times. My grandmother battled with cancer her whole life, and it was cancer that finally got her at the end. She buried her husband. She buried her son of a heart attack. And I, I don't mind telling you that it was, a, it was a hard visit to the home place. I'm telling you this because you've lived this experience. It's not just mine. You know what it feels like to go back to the place where you grew up and to see the place and the stuff that's left by two good, solid church folk. Zechariah, Elizabeth. I thought about what hope looked like in my own family as I read this story through. Of course, it's not the same details exactly. It's not that. But what does hope look like? I thought about it for quite a while, and then I remembered that as my grandmother was dying, she talked a lot about family. I guess she always talked about family, really. She loved her family. But she talked a lot about family, and I realized later as we were sitting around the table that new was born in us. That her old age, that her death was not the end of the story. Just like Zechariah, just like Elizabeth, there was more to come. And the more to come, well, that's my brother Jeremy. It's my Aunt Jane. That's Christy, who is now part of the story. What do you take away from these two figures? You could almost tell me the story by heart. You hear it every year. But what I hope you hear in it is your own story. We all struggle. We all fight great battles over the course of our lives. And yet right here, right here at the very beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ is your story. Your story. You are the hope that your family lives on in. You are the light that hope is born in. Hope that you hear that word today. I hope that the next time you find yourself fretting, worrying, hurting, that you find a little grace to see that this story is just beginning. Amen. Here at First Baptist Church, uh, especially during Advent, we are a people of hope. I hope that you will wait on hope this season. Get a devotion. Get something to accompany you along the way. And you can begin this morning with song as we stand and as we sing together.
as you prepare to go from this place, hear this benediction, this good word. May the strength of Christ uplift you. The comfort of the Holy Spirit surround you. And the grace and mercy of God give you hope and give you courage. This day and every day. Amen. Thank you.